here we have another plural where God says in verse 26, let us make man in our image. Plural. Three plurals. God said let us, that's a plural pronoun. Make man in our image, that's a plural possessive pronoun in English. If it were singular, it would be my. If it were singular in the first case, it would be me. He doesn't say let me make my. He says, let us make our, and in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, and every creeping thing. Okay, verse 27. This is called by theologians in Latin the imago dei. Man is made in God's image. Now, what does that mean? Well, Many writers say that it means that a man has a mind and a will and emotions. Well, you know what? Animals have mind and wills and emotions. They do. Um, but what is it that distinguishes man from the animals? In what sense does ma is man made in the image of God that the lower animals are not made in the image of God? Well, there are more subtle capacities in the mind of man. I think we might call the instincts of animals a form of thinking. And we really don't know for sure what the animals can do from the inside because we've never been inside their heads. We don't know what they think about. But we know that they are instinctive and we know there, there is a, a form of cunning. If you've ever seen a, a cat hypnotize a bird, you know, that cat's got a plan. So they not only think, they think ahead. But here, but here is a capacity which we believe we have that they do not have. They can't reflect. In other words, we not only think, but we think about thinking. We don't think that animals can do that. But I would say that the, the locus, the center of the imago dei, the main thing that distinguishes us from the animals, the main reality which shows that we are in the image of God and animals are not in the image of God, is our capacity for relationships. Now, even there, you know, animals mourn when one of their own dies. I, I've even, an animal even mourns when a human dies. And I've seen it with my own eyes. When my father died, his dog knew it. I won't go into that. But what is it really? It's a capacity for a relationship with God is the thing that sets us apart. Now in John 1, and I realize that some of you have either seen the video or, or were present, we talked about this. One of the great difficulties in the non-Christian ideologies and in the anti-Christian philosophies is the difficulty of defining what man is. And when I say man, I mean men and women. What it is to be human. I would contend that all, that, that all non-Christian ideologies have failed. The Marxists said the key was economic. The Darwinists say the key is biological. The Freudians say the key is psychosexual. The fascists say the key is racial. Jesus said the key is me. You see, how can you understand the creature if you deny the Creator? and if you know nothing of the Creator's design. The Bible teaches that man, you and I, men and women, humans, that man is a fallen image bearer. We'll talk about the fall in chapter 3 tomorrow. A fallen image bearer. Now, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing, and it's a, it's, a, it's a puzzling thing 
that man has the capacity for such nobility, such moral greatness, such sacrifice, even among non-Christians. Why is that? Because all people, including non-Christians, are made in the image of God. It's also amazing that man is capable of such savagery, such wickedness, such evil, even, sadly, sometimes among people who are supposed to be Christians. I don't know if they really are or not, but let's be honest, okay? Um, why is that true? Because we're all fallen, including Christians. We Christians are fallen. And if we look, I mean, was David a saved person? He was. He not only committed murder, but he murdered one of his best friends because Uriah was a member of the Gadolim, the honor guard, the special guard who protected David. And Uriah was so noble that Uriah wouldn't even sleep with his own wife because he was so loyal to David's cause and David's army. But David slept with his wife and then killed him. How can the same person be capable of such greatness and such wickedness because we are image bearers. That's where our greatness and nobility comes from. But we are fallen. That's where our wickedness comes from. And only the biblical definition fully accounts for this. But I haven't finished. Because the definition is part of the problem, but in the definition also comes the remedy, the remedy to the problem, the answer to the problem. The Bible teaches that man is a fallen image bearer who can only be rescued by a wounded healer. And that wounded healer is Jesus, who can restore us to God's full image because when we become Christians, we become like Christ. Romans 8, 29, we are being conformed to the image of Christ. And Christ is perfectly the image of God. I was told I'm supposed to read these verses. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. We are being made like Christ, Romans 8, 29. Christ, who is God and God the Son, is perfectly like God, perfectly like the Father. Hebrews 1, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things. This is like the verse that says, oh, He also made the stars. Listen to this through whom also He made the world. Oh, by the way, God made the world through Christ. And I said it was one and two. It's actually in verse three. He is the radiance of His glory. That is, Christ is the radiance of the glory of the Father and the exact representation of His nature. So, you and I are fallen. That's why we're so bad some of the time. We are image bearers. That's why we do good things some of the time. And that's who we are in Adam, in our flesh, before we are saved. But we can only be rescued and restored to reflect the image of God by a wounded healer. And that wounded healer is Christ. That's what the Bible says about who we are. I'll talk more about that later when we talk about the, the creation of man. So there's purpose, there's design. The, the, the non-theistic evolutionist says that your existence is an accident. I know a father, a godly Christian father, who fell in love with his girlfriend before he became a Christian. And he, uh, she became pregnant and they got married. 
And years later, his godly son, and they never told him. I always say, tell the truth to an adult and a Christian. And when this young man was about 17 years old, somehow he figured out the math. And he came to his dad. And his father's telling me this with tears in his eyes. He came to his dad and said, was I an accident? Was I an accident? That's a hard thing to come to grips with. Let me tell you something. The evolutionist says we were all accidents. But the scripture says that we were designed and that God loved us before we made it. He made us. I shouldn't say this because you'll start thinking about something else, but I want to tie this into God's eternity, the fact that God has no beginning. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to leave it and try not to think about it. God forgive me for even saying this. There was a great Dutch theologian named Ger Gerhardus Voss. And Gerhardus Voss was talking about that verse in Jeremiah that says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And here's what Voss said. He said, um, everlasting is not only everlasting forward. When you say everlasting about God, it's also everlasting backwards to the past. Then this is what he said. And this is true for the Christian. The non-Christian is in a little bit different category. But it's true for you, Christian. Then Gerhardus Foss said this, one reason I know that God will never stop loving me is because He never began. He's always loved us. Now, God does not love us because He made us. God made us because He loved us. God knew us before He made us. That's what Romans 8 means when it says, whom He foreknew, He predestined. Romans 8, 29. Okay, but I'm getting a little bit too theological here. And I'm getting into the New Testament. So, we'll try to stay in the Old Testament. So God purpose God in verse 27, God purposes what He performs. God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Now, some people say that verse 27 means that God made Adam with masculine and feminine characteristics and that he not only pulled a rib out of Adam, but he pulled all those feminine characteristics out of him. So that Adam was a composite being in his original creation with both male and female qualities, which really would mean that God made the female the same time he made the male, and he just took the female out of the male. That's very appealing in some ways, and that that would be one interpretation of verse uh, 27. I don't know for sure that that's a false interpretation, but I don't really think that's what's being told, what's being said. I think verse 27 is just a summary of what God did, and it's projecting a little bit. And let me tell you that, that um, in the West, and this is more true in America than it is in, in, um, in Russia, in the West, we are linear thinkers, and when we listen to speakers or when we read writers, we want them to be very linear in their presentation. Here's what I mean by that. We want a speaker or writer to go A, B, C, D, um, conclusion, application. The Bible is not an American document. 
the Bible is not a Western document. And one place that scholars get tripped up when they try to interpret Genesis 1 and 2 is they want it to be just like that, but it's not like that. Even John 1 is not like that. You know, you think he's finished talking about John the Baptist, then he comes back to John the Baptist again. So, look at me just a minute. The Bible sometimes, instead of being linear, chop, 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 conclusion, application, the Bible is sometimes like a spiral. You start here, but then you come back to the same place. But it's not quite the same place because you're going up. Then you go around and you come back to the same subject, but you know, know more about the subject and you're going up and it's like a spiral going up. Sometimes it's, it's like this. You start right here and you go like this. See, there's more than one model of communication or sticking to your subject. And the biblical model is, is not always linear. Okay. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Now, having mentioned that, I will say this. Time is linear, because this is something I, I failed to say about time earlier. You see, the ancients, and maybe in some moderns, believe that time is cyclical, like the seasons. The Greeks believed that time was cyclical. What do we mean by cyclical? Well, we're in summer now, or almost su summer. Feels like summer. We have summer, then we have fall, then we have winter, then we have spring, and we start over. We're back in the summer, and we do that again and again. It's like a circle. It's like a cycle. Time is not like that. Time was created. It has a beginning and it will have an end. The same God who created time will end time. Okay, I had to go back and mention that so I did, because I didn't mention it before. Um, verse 28 says that God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing. Everything was for the purpose of man. Man was the ruler of all things. Now, this was the original creation. This is not the situation we face today. Verse 29, God says, I'm giving everything to you. I'm giving the beasts and the animals to you, but they weren't for eating yet. Okay? Man ruled the beasts, but he didn't eat the beasts. Okay? In the original creation. And after man is created, there's a new there's a new pronouncement that's different from what God said about all the other th things. God says, after He creates man, He looked at His creation, and before He said, it was good, it was good, it was good. And now He says, it's very good. It's very good. That's Genesis 1.31.